welcome everybody to the session on market-based access systems. Um, my name is Duncan Ledbetter. I run a consulting business based here in Australia. Um, I've spent uh, over 20 years um, involved in market-based systems, having spent some time with uh, the MSC. I've also worked on standards for fair trade and marine trust and others. Had a long interest in how these systems develop and what the alternatives are, and also been interested in how they uh, may or may not work well for small scale fisheries. So I've managed to gather together a group of four panelists here today or tonight, and um, those who've had a lot of experience in their own areas of, um, of business and in their own parts of the world. And so what I'd like to do first is to welcome them um, to the panel. Um, our first presenter is Mr. Hisa Kano. And um, Hisa is the Secretary General and the Technical Manager for the Marine Eco Label in Japan. I thought we'd start off with um, somebody from, from your home country. Um, he has previously worked with Nasui, um, the large Japanese company, as well as Gorton's based in the US. He um, has been involved in market development. He's also been involved in food and seafood business and has a pretty broad knowledge of um, business develop and, um, and development and seafood. So um, he's a very kind of you to agree to come on board today. Look forward to hearing what you have to say. Yeah, thank you for uh, introduction. Yeah, it, uh, it's nice to be here. Yep. So should, should I make a presentation or uh, introduction turn, turn around? Oh, sorry, sorry. Should I start? Should I start now? Uh, yes, please, Hisa. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. Okay. Um, hi. Um, nice to meet you all. Um, I'm Hisa Kano of Marine Equilibrium Japan Council, uh, Japan Equilibrium Certification Program. I'm pleased to be here again to have you know who we are and uh, how to work for small-scale fishery sector in Japan. I hope our practice or approach will be helpful in your initiative to improve the small-scale fishery in your country. Oh, sorry about that. And first, uh, let me tell you about the current Japan fishery circumstance. The total catch has decreased and now about 4.2 million metric tons in 2019. This decrease mainly resulting from withdrawal from distant water due to the shutout from other countries' EEC and the regime shift of Japanese uh, sardine, which showed in blue part. Roughly 3.2 million is the wild catch. One million is aquaculture and the volume of import is around 2.2 million. This slide illustrates Japan fishery diversity and the related community and industry. Japanese rich seafood, uh, Japanese rich seafood culture is also well known as one of the popular, popular food in, in the world. Here is a map that show how fish species are diverse in Japan. Japan is a long island that extends north to south. The species in the north are similar to northern countries like uh, Norway, Alaska, or Russia. While these in the south are to the Mediterranean. The Japan archipelago is surrounded by the two cold and warm currents, which create one of the best fishing area in the world. Japan fishery sector is facing several issues. Fish catch is declining 
probably due to overfishing and climate change, show in the previous graph. The fishery population is also decreasing. Right now, 150,000. The Japanese government has revised the fishery act for the first time in the last 70 years to revive the fishery industry. Above all, fish stock recovery is a prioritized matter most. They launched a science-based stock management program based on the MSY and the introduction of TSC PAC. As for the small scale fishery, the challenges are, challenges are low and unstable catch, aging population and low income and high cost. It made it hard to survive for them. Furthermore, they are required to conduct responsible fishery like uh, sustainability and eco-friendly. I'd like to talk a little bit about the MEL certification program. MEL, or MEL, was established in 2007 and, uh, and then renovated in 2070 to supply domestic and sustainable seafood for the Tokyo Olympics 2020, actually held 2021 though, and uh, to be a driver to change the traditional way in Japan, the fishery sector. MEL obtained the GSSI recognition in 2019 and is one of the nine schemes of GSSI recognized, only one from Asia. So far, there are 171 certifications, of which 17 fishery and 54 aquaculture are certified. This is a structure of the MEL certification program. We adopt the third party assessment and the registration system based on the ISO standard. MEL developed and revised the standard related document and the audit procedure. GSSI recognized that the MEL standards are aligned with the FAO code of conduct of responsible fishery and the eco level guidelines through the benchmarking assessment. The certification body, CAB, Japan Fishery and Resource Conservation Association, gained accreditation from the Japan Accreditation Board, a member of IAF. Transparency, transparency and objectiveness are fundamental. So, we try to keep ourselves open to the public and listen to their voices. This is the concept chart of MEL fishery standard. There are three principles, management and governance, number one, sustainable stock condition, two, and eco conservation, three. Select stock management and taking care of non-target species predators and ETP are the requirement we add on when we apply for GSSI. The aquaculture standard was newly developed when Mel decided to apply for GSSI. Besides animal health and welfare, food safety is essential. In some countries, Aqua farming and the consumption place are different, but Japan is a place both coexist like agriculture. Chemical residue or biohazard risk to human body, resulting from medicine, feed, or coating material of machines and equipment are strictly assessed. This is a chain of custody standard. Important thing is the traceability and the segregation. Don't mix uh, between certified seafood and uncertified seafood. Interest in eco level certification in Japan fishery industry is getting increased. In the past, most people were not interested in that and uh, asked us 
for the substantial merit like, uh, like a value or volume increase if they gain the certification. But now they understand the importance of sustainable use of stock and the environment concerned and uh, positively think of how they can contribute and work on that. In addition to SDGs, they feel if stock and business remain as it is, they will not be able to take over to the next generations, their kids or grandkids. Like in Europe and North America, several retailers in Japan established a sustainable procurement policy in their SDG initiative statements. I will show you some examples in the following slides. Besides, obtaining a certification help review business operation, developing a work procedure or manuals, enhancing employees' participation and uh, improvement of consciousness, implementing a PGC circle, et cetera. This is a beneficial, I believe, for the small scale fisher to improve their business and operation. This is a seafood procurement policy of JCCU, Japanese Consumers Corporate Union, one of the biggest uh, uh, retailers. JCCU has an environment-friendly program called COP Sustainable. They set the target that uh, by 2030, 50% of seafood should be certified. You can see uh, for um, Equilabel uh, scheme the logo. Right one is the MEL. This is the seven and I holdings procurement statement and website information. They set the target that the 50% and 100% of seafood should be certified by 2030 and 2050, respectively. Um, please visit store of Ito Yokado, Yok Benima, or Yok Mart. Uh, all of them uh, belong to uh, the holding. And stop by the seafood section. You can see the packed filet, sashimi sliced pack, pack, sashimi or sashimi combo, all composed of the certified species, such as the yellowtail. Let's see the greens, coho salmon, chang salmon, ground. How does MEL work for the small scale fisheries? Let me show you some approaches. First, we have a relationship with retail or food service customers. So we can help link the fishers to customers or market. Having clear target, uh, having clear target customer or market, give them the motivation to do a lot of work to obtain certification. We also introduce processor or distributor to them in supply chain. Second, few of them know how to prepare for obtaining certification correctly. We periodically hold seminars collaborating with prefectural fishery cooperative association or prefecture government. There is a consultation program for applicant before an actual initial assessment. Although it needs detailed screening, if approved as a candidate, all expense of consultation are no charge. Last, it is essential that uh, the mail doesn't ask for high charges. All its costs are set at a reasonable level, and the local license fee is fixed and very cheap. Mail is appropriate program from economic standpoint. eco level certification system is not business, but social responsibility shared by each layer of society and industry. This is what I want to emphasize the most in this presentation. 
This is the last slide though, which showed example of certified small scale fisheries or aquafarma. Most of them are family running enterprises. While some individuals are certified themselves, fishery cooperative organized group as a unit of application consisting of individual fishers. In Japan, Road of fisher, fishery cooperative is very important to sustain small scale fisheries management. I show MEL approach to small scale fisheries to get certified and improve their management, such as connection with retailer or market, guidance before preparation of assessment, and the local system for certification. If you're interested or want to know more about the detail, please contact, please contact us. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Great. Um, thanks, Hesa. I, I was um, really interested in a number of aspects of that presentation. Some of the fisheries are, are quite small, so it's encouraging to see small volume fisheries participating in, in a program like this. Um, we will probably have questions for you at the end along with the others. So um, okay. I might introduce our uh, next speaker. Um, so our, our next presenter is, is Martin Purves. Um, Martin was once an observer on commercial fishing vessels. Um, he then became a resource manager uh, for the fisheries department in, in South Africa before then taking up a role with the Marine Stewardship Council um, in their Southern Africa program. Um, he left there a number of years ago and is now the um, general, general manager of the uh, International Pole and Line Foundation. So uh, Martin, can I get you to uh, run through your presentation, please? Thank you. Okay, thank you for the introduction, uh, Duncan. Just tell me if you can see the slides and uh... Then I can yep. get going. Uh, just make it full screen. Yep, it's all good. Is that all good? Yep, fantastic. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for the uh, opportunity also to the organizers uh, to talk today. And thanks, uh, Duncan, for inviting me to, uh, to your panel. Um, small scale fisheries uh, is a cause that's close to my heart. Um, the organization I work for at the moment, the International Polar Line Foundation, uh, work with small scale tuna fisheries. Uh, and we are very much focused um, on market access for these fisheries, uh, uh, working with many market partners. That's not the only uh, work we do. We also uh, are working closely with fishers, fishers in the communities and sometimes just looking at uh, uh, improvements on the water as well. So it's not all market driven. But I thought I'd start my presentation just by um, looking at uh, you know, what, what do we see uh, as market-based incentives. The idea is basically that in the marketplace, there's rewards for fisheries or the uh, uh, people, companies involved in those fisheries and supply chains, if they act responsibly. Now, obviously that responsibly is defined by whoever decides what that market-based incentive looks like. Um, and many cases, there's preferential sourcing uh, by market players that could be retailers, it could be food service uh, uh, companies, it could be smaller buyers and suppliers, um, all part of that supply chain. Uh, and it usually entails a structured framework against which sustainability is measured. Um, uh, it could be certification schemes, eco-labeling, there's in uh, wild capture fisheries, there's also an initiative called fisheries improvement projects or uh, programs, which is again, uh, quite a structured approach. And in many cases, it can drive positive change in these fisheries. Uh, I guess, importantly, also when we look at small scale fisheries, it can also act as a barrier to market access, a technical barrier where it becomes a must have, uh, and I'll uh, talk a bit more about that. So what is the reality when we look at um, certification schemes? And I'm specifically talking about wild capture fisheries. 
Uh, in many instances, certification has driven inequity and widened the gap between smaller scale fisheries and large industrial fisheries. And that is because these programs are often focused more on, on large industrial fisheries. Uh, those fisheries producing large volumes, uh, valuable catch can often afford certification schemes. They are better organized in many cases. They uh, sometimes have better support from uh, government uh, systems. And uh, so we, we've seen a sort of a trend where a lot of these certification schemes have benefited um, larger industrial type of fisheries. And that means small scale fisheries are left further behind uh, through some of the market based incentives. Uh, and, uh, you know, once you left out of these markets, you might find it increasingly difficult to access markets in the future as well. Also, what we are seeing is many of the uh, schemes are not necessarily well aligned with the sustainable development goals and the idea uh, of sustainable development where no one is left behind. Um, in premium markets, certification uh, um, uh, has also become a prerequisite, which means if you're not certified or you're not part of a, a structured a fisheries improvement project, uh, you don't have any access to certain mark markets. And that's where the, um, you know, the potential threat comes to small scale fisheries. Uh, as many of uh, the people listening in today will know, the uh, dominant certification scheme for wild capture fisheries is the Marine Stewardship Council. Uh, and also what we have seen in some of these schemes is, is that the business model becomes a driver uh, for, uh, um, uh, you know, defined sustainability rather than ocean conservation or sustainability. Um, so, for instance, with the MSC Eco Label, there's a greater level of income coming from large industrial fisheries because they produce more volume of product, and uh, that means more royalty fees for the MSC through the use of the uh, MSC Eco Label. So, uh, back in 2020, a, a paper was published by Frederick Lamanash and, and others looking at uh, specifically uh, uh, the MSC, and I don't want to carry on too much about the MSC, there are many other certification schemes, but often uh, if you're the market leader, you also attract most of the attention. So what this paper showed and the, the title of the paper basically summarizes it, small is beautiful, but large is certified. A comparison between fisheries, the MSC features in its promotional materials and then MSC certified fisheries. The graph on the left shows uh, that during that period between 2009 to 2017, 83% of the fisheries that were certified were uh, large industrial fisheries uh, with a, a much lower proportion, around 7% of small scale fisheries. Um, that is the, uh, the number of fisheries rather than volumes. When we compare volumes, you obviously would expect uh, industrial fisheries to dominate because they catch more. But also interestingly, what they looked at is how they uh, promote uh, uh, their own eco label, and um, uh, because often the imagery from small scale fisheries is a lot more attractive to consumers, but there's a disproportionate use of imagery from small scale fisheries to promote uh, the uh, MSC eco label compared to uh, imagery from large industrial fisheries. So uh, that was a quite an interesting paper that caused quite a quite a lot of waves. Um, very importantly, I did mention the issue around equity. It's generally recognized that um, their uh, current access to ocean benefits and its resources uh, uh, creates um, uh, large issues around equity with small scale fishers and the communities connected to those fisheries often being left out in the cold. Uh, and those uh, impacts are negative on the environment as well as uh, human health, loss of livelihoods, limited financial opportunities, uh, and increasing gaps between um, those that have and those that, that don't have. And ultimately, it also impacts on uh, things like nutritional and food security. And often, uh, coastal communities where small-scale fisheries operate are the most vulnerable or some of the most vulnerable uh, populations in the, in the world. 
So there's also often a powerful interest, po political interest. It could be um, economic interest uh, that are drivers that further perpetuate the uh, inequality. So when we look at what market players can do, um, and that paper I mentioned uh, previously uh, gave quite a nice uh, definition of you know, the way the uh, market players of the private sector interact in the procurement of seafood, uh, where you can have what's defined as equity blindness. So in, uh, in other words, your procurement decisions can perpetuate uh, inequity, further drive inequity and uh, sideline small scale fisheries. You could have policies in place that um, do no harm. So there's some level of safeguards, which uh, basically uh, ensures the status quo remains. And then you could also mainstream equity in your supply chains, which means you have a positive impact as a business or uh, on the other scale, a transformative approach where really you go out of your way to support small scale fisheries, for instance, to address inequalities of the past. And that challenges uh, the status quo, the sort of disruptive side of, of the supply chain. So what does this mean in practice? Um, there's many environmentally and socially um, responsible small-scale fisheries that are struggling to survive in the marketplace. They are being outcompeted with indust by industrial fisheries that have greater access to fishing and market opportunities. Uh, and many, uh, in many instances, these larger industrial fisheries uh, benefit from uh, subsidies what's called harmful subsidies. We know it's, uh, it's been a, a, a major driver to uh, um, eliminate harmful subsidies in fisheries, although they still remain in place, uh, which means in many cases, um, there's a dis disproportionate investment in larger industrial fisheries through harmful subsidies, vessel construction, fuel subsidies, and that further um, you know, uh, skews the balance in terms of the viability or economic viability of some small scale fisheries. In some cases, we also see buyers and retailers actively promote these subsidized fisheries as the most sustainable choice based on certification schemes or standards that uh, ignore the impacts of harmful subsidies. So, and, and also just to point out that all small, all small scale fisheries are not necessarily good uh, and uh, can also benefit from, from harmful subsidies, but it is quite a disproportionate investment when we compare small-scale fisheries to large-scale fisheries. And uh, a, a much better way to create equity and drive sustainable development and ensure alignment with the uh, sustainable development goals would be to remove those capacity enhancing sub subsidies and instead use those funds to support um, fishers through coastal fishing community projects and specifically small scale fisheries. So that's what's really needed as a transformation in terms of seafood supply chains, if we want to ensure greater alignment with the agenda 2030 and the uh, sustainable development goals. A further link specifically in the fisheries that I work with, um, tuna fisheries, uh, some of the industrial fisheries are also um, uh, use cheap labor, what is uh, referred to as modern day slavery, uh, especially uh, uh, some of the industrial longline fisheries. Uh, um, and that is the sort of equity blindness. Now, some of these fisheries have benefited through certification and have actually, despite the fact that they are certainly not uh, in the view of many people should be uh, seen as a preferential choice and many consumers would be shocked if they knew where their seafood came from, some of these fisheries are being pushed through certification schemes as uh, the most sustainable choice. So, I mean, that is a pretty negative uh, summary of, of the status quo and the issues, but there's certainly also uh, an opportunity uh, where certification schemes uh, 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 that are focused on wild capture fisheries have mostly defined sustainability around uh, uh, environmental issues. And I mean, we need to keep in mind that uh, uh, sustainability has become a, a term that's been abused and has been uh, taken over by the private sector in many instances. And basically it is a, a line in the sand 
uh, that has been defined in some cases quite arbitrarily. Uh, and if you this side of that line, you're supposedly sustainable, and on the other side, you're not sustainable. So uh, if we then also look at social responsibility, um, that uh, is very important also when we look at small scale fisheries and really a new approach is, is needed. Um, social, small scale fisheries are major contributors to social well-being, uh, and this is uh, usually not recognized um, through most of the schemes that are in operation. So, you know, there's opportunity to develop a small scale fishery standard that incorporates both environmental and social aspects, and that could also um, ensure that the uh, inequity that exists in the ocean economy is, is uh, redressed and also ensuring more alignment with uh, Agenda 2030. The legal framework that would be relevant here, the FAO Code of Conduct for Responsible Fisheries, specifically refers to the importance of uh, uh, the contribution of fisheries to food security and food quality. And it's not only focused on uh, environmental sustainability. So you need to see all the aspects of a, of a fishery. And uh, I think that's also important when we look at market-based uh, incentives. There's also the voluntary guidelines for securing sustainable small-scale fisheries, which uh, uh, has been endorsed by most uh, uh, countries in the world and uh, provides a framework for uh, supporting these small-scale fisheries. I've mentioned the sustainable development goals a number of times, but specifically, if we look at uh, SDG 14b, uh, it focuses on the need for uh, greater access to markets and marine resources. So it's not only uh, market access, but also fishing opportunity access. And in tuna fisheries, it's very relevant in terms of uh, allocation. Uh, when we look at the shared resource, in many cases, the, the, the countries that are benefiting most from those shared resource, resources are distant water fishing nations, which come from elsewhere and they uh, exploit the resource and uh, the coastal states often don't see uh, the economic benefits or the food security benefits that are associated with these uh, tuna stocks. So also very important uh, when we look at that sort of market access and what a small scale fishery standard might look like. And of course, this year is also the inter International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture. So I think very topical and uh, relevant that we are discussing this uh, today. So thank you. Uh, that's um, uh, all from my side, Duncan. Great. Um, thanks very much, Martin. Um, it's good to get an overview like that about just how many layers there are to deal with and how many issues there are to deal with. And it's obviously a challenge for small scale fisheries to operate in some of those forums, particularly without some sort of assistance. And IPNLF has been pretty active in um, a lot of those forums. I note that you've been um, just come to Indonesia from, from Europe. And so it's, um, it's a pretty busy life. Um, so our next speaker is um, Matt Fox. Um, Matt, um, I, I met Matt many years ago and um, in, in, in a different life, but still a fish, fish life. Um, after he, um, he, he left Australia 20 odd years ago and um, went to work in Asia. I know that he worked in um, Cambodia and Timor-Leste. He's also done work in um, West Papua and um, in Indonesia. He's currently working in the, in the Philippines. And um, so Matt has quite a has had quite a, an exposure to different types of market based schemes, particularly in Indonesia. And so, a bit of a retrospective um, is very timely, Matt. So um, I'll hand over to you. Great, thank you, Duncan. Let me just get this presentation up. Just bear with me for a moment. Now, we've got a presentation there. Uh, yes. Great. So thank you, Duncan, and, and thank you for, to, to the organizers for, for in, inviting me. Uh, my name's Matt Fox. I'm uh, currently based in Victoria, Australia. I've spent long periods of time living and working in the region. So really pleased to be able to share with you some, uh, some insights um, tonight, specifically from Indonesia. Uh, that came from a project that I undertook just before the 
the pandemic changed everything. So uh, we're going to have a, a, a little look at some findings from a, um, a study I did in Indonesia in 2018. Uh, so just briefly, I'll, I'll talk about the project, what we found, um, both from the supply and demand sides, <clears throat> and then look at some implications for, for uh, small-scale fishery improvements. Okay, so in 2018, I was um, hired to undertake a hired by a national fisheries focus NGO to undertake an investigation of um, supply and demand in domestic markets for seafood products originating from small scale fisheries. So a key point there is I'm talking about domestic markets, although I touch on some, some export markets as well, but the project was to inform the design and trial of a domestic sustainable sourcing platform or, or similar mechanism. Um, I should add that, you know, Indonesia is a huge producer of seafood. I believe it's the second largest producer globally, uh, and much of this is, is consumed domestically. Um, and the project really wanted to understand more about uh, that supply and demand for sustainable seafood in that, in that domestic market in order, be, in order to be, be able to, uh, to design um, market-based approaches. Okay, so the project that was based on the, the understanding that market-led approaches had already uh, been proven to improve sustainability in export fisheries. So there were a number of fisheries, uh, small-scale fishers that were, were benefiting from, from these types of interventions. We'll touch on a couple of those later. Um, the other thing that, that's interesting here, there's an enormous amount of investment in, in small-scale fisheries in, in Indonesia. Um, and... and a lot from both philanthropic and, and public donors. So we were interested in understanding how some of those investments could be leveraged to, um, to, to achieve scale in, in, in some of these market-based interventions. Um, so we were really looking at understanding the opportunities um, for, uh, for those market improvements in domestic markets. You know, there was an understanding that FIPS were working, but they're expensive and, and therefore out of reach to many, many of these small scale fisheries, which, um, as Martin touched on earlier, they include some of the poorest of the poor um, communities uh, in the region. Okay, so what did we find? We looked at 20 um, fisheries sustainability projects. Um, Again, fisheries feeding into domestic supply chains through a series of, of interviews and field visits. And we documented and, and codified the, the sustainability interventions that we saw and, and how they were connecting to markets. Um, so what we found, a lot of this is <clears throat> probably quite obvious, but I think it's worth um, looking at quickly. The, the fisheries that were predominantly supported, obviously there's a huge uh, range of, of mixed gear, mixed species fisheries, you know, reef and often reef associated pelagic fisheries, but tuna, crab, including blue swimmer and, and mud crab, lobster, barramundi, uh, and, and some of those demersal line fisheries for snappers and groupers, bait fish, forage fish, and, and some aquaculture. So many of these fisheries uh, that, that are supported um, in any number of ways were, were often associated with areas of high conservation value. And, um, and some of them were associated with other types of conservation investments, such as marine protected areas, species work, marine spatial planning, um, and, and even some social interventions. <clears throat> we, we observed a range of sustainability efforts. Most of these will be familiar to, to listeners, but what we term fisheries support projects that, that weren't necessarily formal FIPS. Now, though those fisheries support projects could be single point, acting on a, on a single issue or, or, or comprehensive. Um, we saw uh, formal FIPS, both basic and comprehensive, um, and then the usual sort of range of fisheries management tools, harvest control rules, um, empowerment of communities through organizations and associations, a lot of area-based interventions. So fisheries management areas, uh, turf reserve systems, 
uh, rights-based approaches and, and the use of cultural domains as a, as a fisheries uh, management uh, basis. Uh, ecosystem management that ties in with, with the national framework for EAFM. Um, marine protected areas, including very large marine protected areas where predominantly they, they're geared towards local sustainable fisheries production. Many of the MPAs in, in Eastern Indonesia have you know, between five and 10%, which is protected. And the remainder of that is, is, is really set aside for, for local fishing with the benefits of patrol systems and, and, and science and monitoring. So when I say MPAs, I'm really talking about that as a fisheries management tool, which can encompass some of those other things. Um, obviously data collection, monitoring systems, management planning, capacity building and social programs. And lastly, some supply chain and market interventions. An example there being um, the introduction of slot limits for, for red snapper from, um, to, to achieve um, optimal reproduction rate, but also to meet uh, buyer requirements. Um, so look, from, from that, um, that broad sweep, we identified a number of candidates that we assessed to be, be ready for, for immediate inclusion in, in market-led um, market interventions. And, and we'll hear more about the demand side in a moment, but these included mud crab fisheries, snapper, a mixed species fishery, um, a small artisanal line fishery in North Bali, and, and a tuna fishery that had already met fair trade certification. So we, we felt that all of these were, were ready to roll uh, should the, the, uh, the opportunity be there. And, and that was looking at a range of factors from demonstrated efforts towards sustainability, um, you know, capacity, having a compelling story that, that could connect with buyers and, and the fact that they were sought after products. Um, and, and the other big um, barrier for, for many fisheries is, in Indonesia is that supply chain logistics can be prohibitive. So if you're needing to, to island hop fresh snapper across um, you know, three islands, by the time it reaches markets, um, it, it can often uh, have lost most of its value. Um, we developed fisheries profiles of, of those fisheries. And, and the point of doing that was, was to have something to engage buyers with. So just as an example here, this was a fishery that was associated with a fair trade project. Um, we developed uh, a profile that we we're able to take to, to buyers, um, which among other things, described their efforts uh, in terms of their, their sustainability efforts. Um, and provided them with contact details, so encouraging um, buyers to connect directly to the fisheries. Um, so then we went to talk to uh, the demand side. We spoke to consumers, restaurants, hotels, distributors, and retailers, again, in that domestic um, market for small-scale fishery products. Um, firstly, what we learned from seafood consumers. Now, <clears throat> the first thing I would um, note here is that we, we did speak to the, the leading edge of consumers. So um, acknowledging that bias up front, but, but um, so, so we focused on um, areas such as Jakarta, inner city, uh, Bali, where, where there's a, obviously a, a big tourism industry and, and um, you know, really great restaurants and, and innovative um, sort of food uh, a food scene which which is taking an active interest in, in sustainability. So look what we learned um, around 40% of respondents this, this was a basically a, a Vox pop you know a street survey in a, in a shopping center. 40% of respondents were, were aware of eco labels which we felt was high. 10% demonstra uh, um, explained that they had sometimes taken uh, purchasing decisions based on on, on eco labeling. And, and up to 80% claim to have at least once changed brands or products based on a perceived environmental or social problem in the supply chain. So we felt that was um, promising. Um, the next thing we did was just to, just to try and get an understanding of what the, the current market demand for products was. We, we scanned um, menus of the top 20 restaurants to, to see what was in those menus. Barramundi, crab, shrimp, snapper, tuna, and lobster were the, were the, were the, uh, the most popular species there. Um, and then we took the most popular um, sustainable seafood guide to, to assess um, all of those seafood offerings across those uh, top 
20 restaurants and found that um, only 13% of all of those were in the, in the green uh, category or best choice, uh, according to WWF. So despite that strong demand from consumers, we found that only 13% of those um, product offerings actually met the, um, the, the green standard by WWF. Okay, uh, the feedback from restaurants was really interesting. They identified a strong need to maintain focus on quality, localness, social responsibility, as well as um, environmental sustainability. That was a very clear message. Uh, and I think it reflects something Martin said earlier that the need to, to consider a range of objectives in certification to meet the, the needs of, of actors throughout that supply chain. Um, restaurants require small volumes so usually in the tens of kilograms a week and that consistency in supply is also important and if if they can't get their preferred product they need to have a backup product ready to go that they can substitute in the menu um, interesting to note that many just uh, expressed some willingness to to pay a small price premium and in, in some cases we found restaurants were happy to absorb the premium themselves in order to have a sustainable option on the menu so they might take a hit on one dish, but in order to um, promote sustainability more broadly as, 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 as a business ethic um, ethos, then they were happy to absorb the cost. Um, restaurants often needed help too in, in terms of understanding and communicating sustainability to customers. Uh, hotels represent a significant buyer group. Um, they have the ability to achieve scale across multiple jurisdictions. Um, but they, they really need to be able to invest in menus and, and to, um, to buy, a, you know, volumes, an order of magnitude higher than those restaurants. Um, they often have very strict re requirements about, around procurement, although they often prefer frozen product. Um, and their primary aim is to meet customers' expectations. So it was interesting. We found um, some hotels were offering slipper lobster as an affordable lobster option, even though it's a, it's a very different um, product. If those volume issues can be addressed, then, then hotels would represent a significant um, opportunity. Okay, the summary from the demand side. Um, generally, we found there was good awareness among consumers. Um, and there are certainly pockets of progressive consumers that we felt could be a, a leading edge in order to test some of these uh, initiatives. There's a clear indication uh, of growing demand for sustainability from restaurants. Uh, and the signals from other markets were there, but perhaps less clear. Um, from a buyer side, the volumes, quality, and that, that consistency of supply will dictate the terms. Um, the clusters of ref restaurants we identified as a good match for local small-scale fisheries. So, uh, in, in a couple of trials, we, we organised um, you know, five or six restaurants to get together as a buyers group very informally, um, and then we could um, make it worth people's while to get, to get a shipment to them. Um, restaurants create great opportunities to make this hook-to-plate link, which, which I'm sure we're all aware of, um, but there is a willingness to do that. Uh, there was a, a very clear unmet demand for responsibly sourced barramundi, snapper, tuna, crab, shrimp, and lobster. Uh, but the, the main, the, the primary concern of buyers was, was quality. So again, look for opportunities to link that with sustainability. And, and lastly, uh, buyers are very interested in this idea of localness, you know, of, of, of provenance and being able to tell the story that, that demonstrates their links to the community. Okay, a couple of slides to go. Um, we did a, a very quick snapshot. This, this is four years ago, so this is perhaps a little bit out of date, but there is a domestic certification scheme called Seafood Savers, uh, driven by WWF, and it accepts um, fisheries that are already engaged in the MSC. Being WWF, it's um, in some ways a pathway to MSC, but they also accept uh, other fisheries that are engaged in FIPS or what they call better management practices. Uh, aside from that, Fair Trade USA, uh, social enterprises, uh, slow food, uh, which is sort of a campaign-based approach, 
uh, and, and even retailers themselves offering their own sort of local level commitments. But there was very little evidence of certified product um, for sale. So with the exception of Seafood Savers, which is primarily targeting uh, restaurants, uh, sorry, supermarkets. So that's the Seafood Savers logo. It's like a, you know, a, a baby MSC and in many ways a gateway to fisheries that, that, that want to achieve um, MSC through, through the WWF um, national footprint. So what does this mean um, for future sustainability efforts? Um, in data deficient small scale fisheries, there are many ways to consider sustainability and I, I won't go through these all, but these are the types of um, sustainability initiatives that we saw. So one example might be a, a marine protected area or an ecosystem based management um, being used as a proxy for stock sustainability. We talking about reef species. So um, there are ways of getting around that data deficiency. Um, and there are a range of things that we can look at to, to understand uh, how far along that journey a particular fishery is at. Again, including some of those community development and social uh, objectives. Um, the enabling conditions are there to do more. So market-led processes have already brought improvements as we saw with the fair trade tuna. Um, there's a clear support for, for domestic sustainable, sustainably sourced product from, from those buyers I mentioned. And again, there, there's significant investment already in, in improving um, small scale fisheries from a range of NGOs and, and other supporters. So that can be leveraged. Uh, and, and there were everywhere we went, there were actors willing to engage and to participate. So that was very promising. Uh, there are multiple opportunities to progress sustainable um, small-scale fisheries. A sustainable sourcing platform was one that we looked at, um, which would link things like um, FIPS certification, but also some of these um, less robust um, uh, assessments of sustainability, campaigns, and, and generally uh, committed people that, that wanted to network on this stuff. Um, you could expand existing certifications, connect to regional efforts. Um, we we've still felt that there was a, need, a, a gap or a need for an affordable and independent small-scale fisheries standard that would appeal to all actors. Um, the, the one limitation of seafood savers, I think it was perceived as a WWF initiative and with so many different conservation and fisheries NGOs um, sort of vying for space, there may be some reluctance in, 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 um, uh, in, in working with that program. Not to say it's not a good program, it, it, it definitely is and it's doing some good work. Uh, direct buyer relationships, new types of market entrants, including social enterprises, um, you know, potentially a national coalition or alliance similar to the CASTs in North America or the Brazil, Brazil Alliance. And generally these campaigns that can bring people together. Um, and multiple pathways again. So, um, so the the um, sustainable sourcing platform I mentioned um, that that's a concept that has since taken off. And there's one in the Philippines, a good working example of that, called One Catch, which I think had USAID support. Uh, but it links buyers, uh, producers, and and distributors and and supporters of sustainable domestic seafood. Um, and, and lastly, um, there are re some really unique opportunities for, for domestic um, sustainable markets. So this uh, fisheries management happens at multiple scales. So it could be a, at a regional EAFM scale, provincial, uh, local level, marine protected area, or even some of those cultural um, frames. So there are multiple options for, for defining a unit of assessment. Uh, and, and also the uh, domestic efforts can be linked to national policy directions like food security or boosting GDP or employment. So, so for that reason, they may be more likely to be uh, supported by government. Um, of course, we need to bear in mind that the smaller the scale, the, the less ability to pay for, for entry into such a scheme. Okay, last slide, and I'll finish with this. Uh, sustainable, responsible, or good, particularly dealing with some of these um, Smaller buyers, there really is um, some confusion about what we're talking about, whether it's sustainability, social responsibility. Um, so 
it, it reflects the desire by many buyers to see fisheries improvements as, as a means of uh, improving the well-being of coastal communities. Um, and, and buyers um, seeking that quality and consistency of supply. So the opportunity is really to examine how these multiple objectives might be linked under uh, a unified approach. Uh, I'll leave it there. I know I'm a few minutes over time, so thank you. Great, um, thanks, Matt. Um, anybody who starts a presentation with a picture of mullet is always going to get my attention. I think it's one of the great undervalued species. So, um, yep, you had my attention right from the start. Uh, thank you. So, lastly, and the person who gets the above and beyond award because it's like what 2:30 in the morning or 2:45 in the morning in um, British Columbia, Canada. Um, is Corey Pete. Um, Corey, I, I won't dwell too much on all the introductory stuff, but to say that you're the founder of a um, Canada-based company called Post Elsia, and um, which is involved in um, sort of connecting um, markets and, um, and, and, and seafood, particularly for work in chefs. Um, Corey was also a, um, uh, an instigator of a um, an initiative in Southeast Asia called the Asian Seafood Improvement Collaborative. Um, uh, yeah, Corey, I'll hand over to you. So please fire away. Thanks, Duncan. <clears throat> I'm happy to be here. And um, uh, perhaps this is a historic moment where uh, someone from Victoria, Australia, and someone from Victoria, British Columbia are speaking on the same panel about seafood. So that's always exciting. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to try to talk to you a little bit about um, the work we've done in Asia, which is called the Asian Seafood Improvement Collaborative. But from my lens as someone who, who lives in Canada, um, what, it, what that experience maybe tells us about how we need to be thinking about the complexity within seafood supply chains and maybe working towards embracing that complexity rather than trying to simplify it too much. So we, Pistelsi is just a, a nerdy name for seaweed. It's a seaweed that grows here in BC. And um, my wife and I named our consulting company af after it. But we really started our work in, in Asia about 10 years ago. And the experience to summarize a lot in a, in a sentence or two really kind of led us to see that there's a lot of value when you bring people together and let them have their own voice. Seems stupid to say out loud, but that was the experience that we saw. And it's a different kind of approach when thinking about sustainable seafood in that it's not, it's not necessarily true that big is better. And we, we saw in, in Martin's presentation about how, you know, 83% of um, MSC is, is these big fisheries and um, a lot of the small scale producers are being left out. So this is what we would call the essence of place-based sustainability. And this has more or less already been touched upon, but this is kind of the state of sustainable seafood, I should say sustainable seafood globally, that after 20 years of effort, and this data is, is data that's from the NGOs and the certification schemes, and by their definitions of what they would call buy, still only 28% of global seafood is considered to be a buy. And, you know, about three quarters is basically don't buy or unknown. And of course, a lot of this is going to be food fisheries and things like that. But the point is, is that we need more tools in the toolbox and not less. Um, and also, you know, we would point out that there's um, really a lack of ability to kind of recognize those that are doing exceptional work. Um, global standards do a good job of recognizing, uh, sorry, of eliminating the, the worst actors, but they don't really recognize the best. And that is in many ways a, a bit of a hole in the sustainable seafood space. So from our lens at Pastelsia, we think that these are some of the factors that are really important in, in how we think about a, a new approach to uh, seafood improvement. The first is really that sustainability is a continuum. Um, it's not something that there really and truly is no end point. And especially when you start to say, okay, sustainability has to be more than just environment. 
because most of it, most of the discussion has been uh, around um, environment. But of course, we now know today that there's climate equity, labor rights, traceability, um, and um, and then of course, as has already been touched upon, uh, we need to work on equity issues and how do we foster that engagement. And then what we've found is that as you go deeper and as people like Martin and, and Matt and Duncan help, and uh, he's already know there's, there's lots of stories out there, but we just need the ability to tell those stories with effective tracking metrics, technology and innovation and assurance models. So that's what we essentially think a place-based approach is. It really kind of targets a community or region and, and um, seeks to address the sustainability issues that are relevant at that level. And most, the most important part of it is that the producer voice is, is at the table. It's, it's heard loudly, respected, and given a chance to you know, be the voice that makes sense. So in other words, another way to say this is you're putting place, people, and culture at the center of sustainable seafood design um, instead of prioritizing what the buyers need or their NGO partners. So this is, now I'm just going to shift to talking a little bit about ASIC, but I want to make it clear that all of what I just said is all kind of lessons learned from this this ASIC project. So ASIC stands for the Asian Seafood Improvement Collaborative. Um, and it's really a private sector collaboration that came um, from Southeast Asian countries um, under a USAID project um, that, that uh, was working on sustainable seafood, uh, had a, a public and private task force and you know brought all of these stakeholders together to talk about pathways for sustainable seafood. I got brought in as a consultant and, um, you know, was, was fascinated at USAID's ability to, to bring people together. And then somewhat stupidly um, realized that there was all this interest in defining their own pathways. Um, seems silly to say out loud, but, Today, ASIC has an executive committee that consists of, of these folks. And it was them and their colleagues really that, that worked for um, about three or four years to build both a shrimp aquaculture improvement tool, um, as well as a fisheries improvement tool. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so I'm not gonna go into detail here, but just to show you that ASIC either has or is working in, in these five countries. Um, and uh, most of our work today focuses on shrimp aquaculture in a partnership with Oxfam and the Swedish embassy uh, in a project called Gracie, which stands for Gender Responsible Agricultural Investments in Southeast Asia. Um, our fisheries program is still kind of uh, trying to get its legs. Um, and over the last three year, few years with our uh, partnership with Oxfam, we've managed to develop a social and gender standard that is designed to, um, you know, address some of these important issues. One of the one of the benefits of the Oxfam project is the the fact that there's been uh, experts, gender experts, that have been on their team, and they've been able to work with some initial ideas that ASIC had uh, to build this standard out. Now, obviously the pandemic has certainly hindered things. We, we certainly haven't been able to take this standard to the next step because um, we haven't really been able to do face-to-face -face meetings. So this is still very much in its infancy. Okay, so I'm gonna shift to just talking quickly about what uh, ASIC, um, the ASIC fish looks like. And this was really, as I put in the slide here, this was our vision in 2014, right? And Duncan and others were, were at that table, but I, I want to emphasize this is, this is a group effort. Um, there was, there was about 25 to 40 people involved and we started with a blank page. So I'm not trying to say this is all me or anything like that. This, if anything, it was, it was many, many others. Um, but the goal is really just to keep it simple, keep it, make it credible, be efficient. 
um, cover the core issues and, uh, and make it align with the international standard schemes. I mean, if you, to lay this out very crudely, obviously with all of us on the call know that we need to be working on this bottom, bottom rung. We need to be working on um, how do we improve in that realm? And, you know, of course, I think this slide is a little bit old, but I think we can debate whether certification is the only pathway uh, nowadays. So when we did this, we really just focused on three core things. One was benchmarks that measure key issues, and this was done in an ASEAN context, Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Um, we, we wanted to have a, an improvement system that would allow a verification to step in and um, track uh, compliance. And then of course, we wanted to make sure it was defined and implemented uh, using credible syst systems. And that was really just based on uh, stakeholder engagement. Um, and um, that's really the, the first part of that credible development part is, is making sure that you have the uh, appropriate stakeholder representation and you have effectively the correct uh, an effective system of how you um, conduct meetings and give stakeholder voices, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we did follow this. And as you can see, there was a lot of meetings in, a, in about a four year period. Uh, these were both for shrimp aquaculture, as I said, but also for this fishery improvement protocol. And um, it was, uh, it, 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 this was kind of the formula, um, you know, stakeholder engagement tapping into that country knowledge and expertise and, and then bringing in international sustainability criteria. So we use things like the Good Fish Code, um, even Seafood Watch standards and, and other things um, as inputs into the process. And what essentially got developed was uh, something fairly simple that had both environmental and social benchmarks because eight years ago, there wasn't as much talk about social as there, are, there is today. Um, and really, this is just a very simple demonstration of, of one of the uh, points of, of the protocol. As you can see, there's about four benchmarks, 11 interim goals, and 38 steps for improvement. So this 1.1 here is, uh, sorry, 1.1.1 is what we would call it an interim goal. And the idea was just quite simple. If you don't collect data, then these are some simple steps that you can take to try to collect data. And once you do that, it, it just took you down a process of getting more and more complicated. Um, but but it was still a very simple tool that um, you know was developed about, as I said, about eight years ago. And the idea was that there would be some pre-assessments, some improvement plans, and then some implementation support from ASIC. And then ideally, some kind of annual checking on the improvement steps. Now, it's important to understand that um, we never really put that into reality because there wasn't necessarily enough value in, well, who's gonna pay for verifying something that's improving, um, especially if it's not going towards certification. I think today we are now seeing that there is probably more value in this approach. Um, be, and, and 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 I'll, and I'll tell you why I think that as, as, as the next part of the presentation. Um, so how do we create leverage for this change? Because I think that was an, that was an obstacle that ASIC ran into. So I think one of the interesting things that's happening right now is this program called Seafood Map, which is part of the Global Sustainable Seafood Initiative. And while it's a little hard to describe Seafood Map exactly. It literally is a map that is seek, seeking to put these types of projects like ASIC, like others, on a map that then sort of showcases what they're, the work that those groups are doing in a way that buyers around the world can see and um, ideally accept with or without the certification. Um, this is just from their, their website, but it, it, it's seeking to be a, a globally inclusive platform. And from my lens, um, I have some high hopes that this could be a really interesting development. In addition, there's an, an initiative now called Green or Blue, which is a Google food 
uh, initiated accelerator that is working towards um, uh, supporting uh, development of, of a dashboard. These little hexagons are called Foodicons, and I won't go too much into detail, I'm running out of time. Um, but it's a, it offers a very interesting opportunity to have this way for these producers to connect their stories in more interactive ways um, in, in a using a more common language. Um, and then in addition, um, my company Pistelsia works a lot with, with chefs. And as was mentioned, chefs in restaurants um, are potentially really interesting lever here as well. And we couldn't agree more as we've worked with chefs over the course of about five years, we've seen how chefs are really looking for different ways to uh, be leaders. Um, this is one of the tiers of the program. And in the program that we've just relaunched after the pandemic, we've added into an, imp an improving category to try to help chefs be drivers. Um, there's not from our read, enough chefs directly supporting, you know, projects like IPNLF, at least that I, I know of, maybe Martin will correct me on that. Um, but chefs are really interested in these stories and, and they want more. So we need to give them that opportunity. So I'll just conclude by saying that, um, you know, it goes without saying that stakeholders want and need a place at the table when we develop sustainability solutions. But in my opinion, the our world is complex, so our solutions, it's okay that they're complex. There's too much, oh, we need it simple. It's not simple. We need to realize that and we need to sort of just accept it. And as a result, I think that, you know, buyers have been sourcing sustainable seafood and been at the table for about 15 years. Now it's time to evolve their sourcing commitments to be more than just the global certification standards. Um, of course, burden of change must not fall solely on the producers. And there are fascinating stories in seafood that are that are valuable and waiting to be told to the right buyers. So thanks for the time. Thanks for the opportunity, Duncan. Yeah, thanks, Corey. And um, yeah, again, our appreciation for you. Um, so sacrificing your sleep for, for the night. So um, I, I, I think having sort of watched all of this develop over time, um, a, a lot of it was before its time. And, um, and I think there is a lot of increasing demand for different approaches and um, sort of smaller scale verification based schemes that ASIC and others have put in place. So um, I, I um, should open up for questions if we don't get any questions i actually have a couple of things i'd like to ask you guys about um I, I i don't know whether we just you know somebody puts their hand up or or how it works um but i'll i'll wait to see what happens um in, in the interim um I, I thought there was um a couple of observations on on my behalf one of them was about the increasing social focus um you know fisheries um, whether they're large or small, involve people. And, um, you know, the, the people can be involved in either the catching or the, or the, or the processing of, of fish. And, you know, it's, um, it, it's really important to sort of bring that social focus on, on board because the fish don't look after themselves. It's, it's people who, um, who interfere with them and so people need a, an interest. Um, the, the second thing in is about the sort of diversity of approaches which you guys have spoken about but but lastly that the, the cost side of things um and so i i recall hisa talking about how um mel is is cost effective and and maybe hisa if you could um you know explain how you've um sort of manage costs in, in the MEL program, because I think that's one of the keys to success for the small scale producers is, is making sure it's cost effective. Oh, um, okay. Um, regarding the cost issue, um, uh, we intentionally uh, set a reasonable price uh, because uh, a reasonable cost, because uh, you know, uh, we don't want to uh, ex exclude uh, the candidate, the applicant. Um, even small scale, uh, you know, uh, can afford to, uh, to to take initiative of sustainability. You know, that's a 
uh, not from us, but uh, a, a government and industrial policy. And actually, um, you know, uh, we met some applicant uh, who originally wanted to uh, obtain MSC certification, and then they took the initial audit, which is free. Uh, but uh, you know, once they see the cost, cost, uh, they, um, they they give up. Yeah, that's uh, uh, you know exactly what uh, we meet. You know, um, a lot, especially uh, for for small small scale uh, fisheries, they cannot afford to uh, you know uh, take uh, take audit of MSC. But but uh, if they want to pursue um, overseas market, you know, expansion of ex export, like uh, European market, the North American market, MSC brand is uh, big, and uh, uh, they try to uh, uh, obtain the MSC uh, because of because of the brand, you know, um, uh, advantage. Uh, yes, so that's uh, you know what, what, what we heard. Okay. No, thanks. It, it, sorry. It, it, sorry. Yeah, it depend. It depend on the. It depend on the. You know, um, where, um, what they want, what they want. If they're focusing on domestic market, um, they may choose uh, MEL, but they want to expand overseas market, MSC. So that's kind of a you know borderline. Mm -hmm. That was the. Right. That, that, thanks, Hesa. It's a it's an important area. Um, Matt, I mean, a lot of the um, initiatives that you mentioned were funded by NGOs or projects, and I suppose that's always um, subject to the the level of interest amongst donors. And there may be short term projects. I mean, the the world is littered with um, with projects which just stop when the money runs out. Um, how how do we make these schemes? Um, you know, self-sustaining. Well, I mean, what makes um, fishers and the supply chain feel that these things are are worth a small amount of money out of their own pockets? Mm. So, look, part of, part of the um, the reason for doing that project, um, <clears throat> more and more donors were were expecting, as you say, to address that end of project lifespan issue, and. Um, so there's a group of, of donors in Indonesia that, that basically gets together to, to set the scene, to set the agenda. And um, so a lot of projects were, were being encouraged to, to I guess, to, uh, to invest in these, these longer term outcomes around fisheries. And the idea was, obviously, if you can get a fishery on, on track to certification or, or some preferential market arrangement, um, then the benefits will continue. Um, so I think there's a role there for the donors, and, and you're seeing. I think someone mentioned Corey may have mentioned USAID before. They're, they're a pretty influential sort of vo voice in a lot of these discussions, and um, a lot of the North American um, philanthropics also have their own sort of domestic agendas around um, certification as well. So I think the donors are playing a big role there. Um, but you know, with any of these projects, the timeframes don't necessarily match up. It's typically, a three to to five year project timeframe, and and to and to get a fishery sustainable and then get it on track to certification within that timeframe is impossible. So, I think the projects that were most successful are, are those that have a very long term sort of set vision, and and they just stick at it for ten or. 20, even 20 years and, and and they're the ones it's a long process but um you know that that um s sort of fits with with um Corey's sort of place-based approach I guess is is really sort of settling into the place and and, and getting to know everybody and, and taking a long-term view of it so I think that that could go some way mm. to addressing that thanks but so um Corey one of the things I liked about um, the way ASIC was developed was that it was very bottom up. I mean, it was basically developed by people in Asia. It wasn't sort of um, people from 
outside sort of coming in and um and saying this is how it should be done there was some guidance there obviously but um i, I was i was quite amazed how um when you walked through with people they basically came up with the same sort of areas of sustainability indicators so i mean it, it it's um what, what what's your sense of these sort of bottom-up approaches as opposed to things being imposed from other regions of the world i mean my thoughts on that um are really just that you know it kind of taps into to more fundamental elements of our human nature which is that we are all genuinely proud of where we're from and our people and our culture and and we like to talk about that and i think that's the mistake that we make when we take what are really more colonialist approaches to say no our way is better we know better than you do and we're not being mindful enough in terms of how we tap into that that's what i that's what i mean when i say it seems stupid to say out loud that people want their own voice but they do and and so there's there's that element but there's also just that element of when you get people together and you start to get to know them um that that kind of camaraderie happens Right. And if you can get that kind of camaraderie happening around this sense of place and, and celebrating that, I think it can be very interesting. So I, I think we're just kind of underestimating the importance of that. And going back to your previous question, I think based on that, there's also then the opportunity to bring the right people in to kind of work with and celebrate that. And that's where the chef angle comes in because, you know, generally speaking, buyers are. <laughs> can be very business focused and, and not as warm as say like a chef who really wants to be out there championing these things. So that's actually one of the things ASIC's trying to do right now is, is work with some um, American chefs. Uh, well, there's a chef named Chef uh, David, uh, sorry, Chef Tu David Fu. He's, he's a Vietnamese American chef and we're trying to engage him in the Vietnamese project as well as the other initiatives and uh, to just try to foster those connections and see where they can go. So it, it's still very much, a, uh, you know, the jury's still out, but that's, that's how we see it. Mm, okay. So, so Martin, um, l lastly, you know, there's, there's obviously different marketplaces and, and IPNLF sort of plays in the, in the commodity marketplace, you know, with canned tuna, and it's a very different um, place to play than what, say, Corey was just describing with, with chefs and, you know, boutique small volume fish. Are there lessons from IPNLF's engagement with um, the big end of town um, that can be brought to bear in this in terms of um, connecting them with small scale fishes? What, what, what are the magic magic buttons you need to push to get a big retailer to go, I want that fish? Yeah, I don't think there, there are any magic buttons, uh, Duncan, unfortunately, but uh, uh, you know, I think there are many uh, buyers and retailers that are uh, really interested in trying to secure uh, seafood that is um, not only environmentally sustainably uh, sustainable, but also socially respons responsibly sourced. And uh, I think it is just sort of engagement with those retailers and the opportunity to, you know, have those conversations. Unfortunately, in the marketplace, there's also many NGO uh, actors that uh, closely closely guard these relationships with uh, with retailers. Uh, and sometimes uh, those conversations become very difficult unless uh, the NGO partner of that particular retailer is also, you know, supportive of these type of approaches. But I think the more we talk about it, uh, the more there is a realization that it is the right thing to do. Uh, it's not an easy process. Um, and certainly when, you know, in, in the current um, economic times often the the main consideration when buying seafood uh, even at the uh, uh, responsible retail sector is pricing and quality and those are the two main uh, components that that they look at and you know after that comes traceability and and sustainability initiatives so it's uh, not always an easy conversation you have a conversation with a 
the CSR department of the retailer and they're very keen and interested. And then you get to the, uh, the people that actually have to uh, make the business work and look at what the competitors do. Uh, and that's sometimes where uh, it's difficult to, to take that conversation further. But I think there's certainly uh, 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 enough responsible actors around to, to have those conversations. And the more we talk about it, the more engagement we'll get around these type of issues. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think in, in terms of wrapping up, that's a sort of very good place to, to, to leave it, Martin. It's, um, I mean, market-based systems are not the, the holy grail. They're an, an addition to the, um, to the jigsaw puzzle in terms of seeking sustainability and expecting all businesses to be, um, you know, clean, green and committed is, is just unrealistic. But I mean, there are some you know, really committed and wonderful people out there who believe that their businesses need to have a solid basis in the future for whatever reason. And um, that's why it's been, you know, for 20 years, as I'm sure you guys will, will, um, will, will agree, it's a fascinating place to work. And I think it still has a long, long way to play out. And we can apply the learnings from the last 20 years to refine the systems to make them more relevant and easier to access for, for small scale fishers. So really want to thank you guys for um, making time and, um, and participating in this. Uh, I, I think this is just the start of conversations that will play out over the coming year. And um, particularly with this series of, um, of um, small scale fisheries congresses. So um, with that, I'd like to say thank you and um, Hey, sir, many thanks for um, having your country host us and looking forward to... Um, yeah, it's to, far um, from here. <laughs> future. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I think there's a yellow waving hand just coming up the screen, so that must mean... There's another one. We need to... Mm -hmm. must mean we need to go. Okay. okay. See you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.